Uh, good morning and welcome to the 11th meeting of the committee in 2015. Uh, if you wish to use tablets or mobile phones during the meeting, please switch them to the flight mode as they may otherwise affect the broadcasting system. Uh, some committee members may refer to tablets during the meeting. Uh, this is because we provide uh, meeting papers in digital format. Uh, agenda item one uh, is to agree to take agenda item four in private. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, our next agenda item today is consideration of a negative SSI, the Local Government Pension Scheme Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015. That's SSI slash 2015 slash 87. Uh, members have a cover note from the clerk explaining the instrument. As you will note, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has pointed out that this instrument contains nine drafting errors. So the Scottish Government has agreed to lay an amending instrument after the start of the new financial year to correct these defects. Do members have any comments? Uh, for the official report, I'd like to record our disappointment at the continuing high level of inaccuracies contained within the statutory instruments we consider, given the statutory instruments are law. I would like to note our thanks to the members of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, their staff and parliamentary lawyers for their good work in addressing these ongoing issues. That being said, are we agreed not to make any recommendation to the Parliament on this instrument? Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item three is uh, our local benchmarking system annual review and we will have an oral evidence session with witnesses from Solace Scotland and the Improvement Service on the ongoing progress of the local government benchmarking framework. Uh, as members will know, we've taken a keen interest in the progress of the framework and have held annual evidence sessions on its de development for the last few years. So I'd like to welcome Angela Leach, who is the current chair of Solace uh, and is also chief executive of East Lothian Council. Colin Mayer, the Chief Executive of the Improvement Service, and Emily Lynch, Senior Project Manager at the Improvement Service. Uh, before we move to questions, do you have any opening remarks that you'd like to make? Thank you very Mr. much. Mr Mayor. Uh, we'll be very brief uh, because I think the paper, I hope, is reasonably self-explanatory and raises the questions. I mean, first of all, just to thank the committee for its continuing interest and support in developing the benchmarking framework uh, and to record certainly my own interest in the comments you got back from your online uh, survey of people's responses to the framework. What the paper does is just to refresh the point that the purpose of the framework is to create a range of high-level comparable measures across the 32 councils. We've explicitly across time used the language of can openers. What these indicators do is pose questions for councils rather than answer them. And the language of drill down has been used recurrently by us in respect of that, that if a council looks off trend on a particular indicator, it poses the question, you then drill down within your services and engage with your communities around why this would be the case and how improvement can be made in that. So we hope it is one contribution to a whole range of improvement tools uh, that councils are using. Uh, and just to reassure some of the people who fed back on your online survey, uh, it fits into for example, self-assessment using EFQM or variants of EFQM across the 32 councils and community planning partnerships. What we would... Ex um, spell out what the, the acronym actually means, oh, I do beg your pardon. Uh, Mr Mayor. Uh, it, uh, it, it's we, the European Foundation for Quality Management. It's a self-assessment model used both in the private sector and there's an adapted version called the Public Service Improvement Framework used in Scotland in the public sector. Uh, apologies. Um, the benchmarking framework continues to be in development, and I think there are areas that still need substantially strengthened, including around our understanding of children's learning, growth and development across uh, the period preschool and then throughout their primary and secondary schooling, and work is ongoing to try and get to comparable measures in that. Uh, a final point from myself would be we are still operating within the framework of an Accounts Commission directive, uh, as I think the committee has discussed in the past. This framework replaced the statutory performance indicators that were previously laid down by the Accounts Commission. However, the Accounts Commission does place a directive in councils annually. They must report 
on the local government benchmarking framework data and they must put it into their own local public performance reporting. So the reporting part of this is happening at council level and down to communities. The framework is there to support councils in having the data they need to report to communities. If I might also introduce uh, Angela, just to say a bit about how the framework is actually being used at council level and with communities. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, at a local level, I've taken the opportunity to speak to some of my colleagues in advance of, of, of coming here, and I think it's fair to say that um, the, the, the benchmarking framework is now firmly embedded in the public performance reporting that local authorities do. Um, all of the indicators appear to some degree um, in, in each of the 32 reports that um, are produced on an annual basis. Beneath that, there are um, a further range of measures that support the, the, the benchmarking indicators, and that allows us to drill down either into more thematic groups or to geographical areas. Um, and I have some examples that I can um, explain further, um, further into the meeting. Um, as Colin said, though, I think that um, it is... On a practical basis, um, benchmarking is used very much as part of the improvement toolkit that, that we have. Um, and again, we have a, a variety of examples where um, using the benchmarking data that is then used to um, develop improvement plans and future service plans, um, which in turn then are monitored through the benchmarking indicators. Um, and we e equally now um, that we have three years analysis, three years data, are seeing trends, and that trend data is becoming very useful in further engagement with our communities, um, in discussion with, um, with communities as to priorities, um, how we might change some policy decisions, um, or whether there are efficiencies that could be could be made, and that's where the family groupings are in increasingly important. Looking at comparisons elsewhere in Scotland and the learning that we can individually take back to our own local authority area. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, as part of this exercise, we actually went out to the public and asked uh, their views on uh, the framework, and have had some varied responses. Um, can I start with uh, one from a, a Fife environmentalist, um, which will come as no surprise probably that I'm starting with that one, because uh, we asked, we want, uh, we want to hear your views on the benchmarking system. His immediate response was, my view is that it is mince. On a good day, I might be generous and give it two out of ten. How could you persuade the Fife environmentalist um, that this uh, framework is uh, working? Um, and that it is making a difference compared to uh, the previous performance indicators that were used? Uh, firstly, and I, mean, I think I would take one of the points raised very forcibly and succinctly by the Fife environmentalists, uh, that if this was being presented as a measure of environmental outcomes, including carbon emission and so on, and Fife, it isn't that. Uh, it is a benchmarking framework of what councils call their environmental services. Uh, and that means we're looking at waste collection, street management, uh, and so on. So I think there is a bit, if what the Fife environmentalist wants is a statement of outcome, there is a parallel bit of work going on with community planning partnerships, which represent all of the public agencies and areas, to get to a set of fairly standard outcome statements that will be published annually, uh, that will allow the public to look at how things are changing in their area. So this is a benchmarking framework to help people who run services to compare themselves with other services elsewhere. The Fife environmentalist is entirely right. It is therefore not measuring the type of environmental outcome for Fife he would wish to see, but I would reassure him there is a parallel bit of work going on there. What I can also say is that uh, in terms of how does this work, and I think Angela will talk more to this as well, uh, that where people seem to be significantly out of kilter in terms of how other councils like them are performing, this is now being used to drill down quite hard to say, well, why is that? Is it a fault in our systems? Is it something to do uh, with our mechanisms for delivery and so on? And that then leads into improvement planning and improvement delivery. So I think we could give examples, and Angela could talk a bit more to this, of where this is being used in quite practical ways to drive forward change in services. But the core point about outcomes is a valid one the Fife environmentalists raised, and it is being addressed uh, in a parallel stream of work. 
Poetic and Ms Leach, uh, Alec Rowley, you've got a supplementary. Just really that, that point that he makes about what it is. I mean, I think what he's really saying is that you're, what is it you're measuring and you're not necessarily measuring the right things. And I suppose that's the point. I remember when the benchmarking came out a couple of years ago, and if you looked at it, it was the comparison was the cost of um, children in care. And if you looked at Fife and done a comparison with a similar sized authority, South Lanark, um, Fife's costs were way, way much higher. But it was then what sat behind that. And, and, and the, if I remember correctly, the Fife homes um, were, were much smaller homes. The South Lanark homes were much larger homes. But what then sat behind that? Because did it mean that, that in the five homes, children in care had more chances of succeeding? Was it better quality care? So how much does, does this benchmarks and exercise, I suppose, what I'm trying to get to is, what is it you're measuring and, and, and is it meaningful? And are, are, are you measuring like for like between authorities? And Ms Leach? I think we are. I mean, it is very much a can opener. Um, I think the example that you give about um, children's services my, you know, I, I, we, we use this very extensively. Um, and the key thing for me is that services are self-aware. They know um, why the differences exist. And I think that we should expect differences because each of our local authority areas are, are very different and we have different practice. Elected members are appointed on a manifesto. They determine local policies that are different. And it's on the basis of those policies then that some of the practices within local authorities then are, are undertaken. I think that, that example, though, um, I would expect there would be deeper analysis to look at. Um, in having smaller homes, in having that higher staff ratio, are the outcomes for these young people any better? And if not, then what can we do? Is there a policy change? Is there a practice change that needs to be undertaken? And that's where it comes into the improvement, the wider improvement agenda, um, so that you're looking at it, not just on, in terms of the raw data, but probably being engaging with other professionals. What could we do differently? Um, and particularly on the attainment side, is, is, is crucial. So, I mean, we do have a lot of examples where... Um, it, it, on the face of it, the raw data would look as if we're, you know, each individual authority isn't perhaps um, performing as well as either the national um, average or as other comparable um, uh, local authorities. But when you do look be beneath that, you can then understand why. Um, and then that's up to individual councils to determine whether or not that practice wants to con they want to continue with it. If I take my own area... Um, our road services, uh, we currently spend more on roads than the national average. Um, but one of the, um, the reasons for that is at this point in time, our investment is not just in resurfacing, but when we're doing the resurfacing, we're looking at drainage, we're looking at curbing, particularly on our, our rural roads, because in the longer term, um, we know that that will he then help to have the, the resurfacing last for a longer period of time and make that investment um, more, more best value. So it's the self-awareness that's really crucial previous sessions that uh, all of these uh, uh, metrics were to be uh, caveated by authorities like you have just done in the case of um, East Lothian's roads. Is that happening and are, have the general public got an understanding um, that, that uh, there are these caveats in place because local decision making uh, has made uh, some authorities do things in certain ways compared to others? Can, can I say something about that? Certainly, um, we worked with local councils recently to look at how they would provide this information to the local public and how they would provide those caveats or, if you like, that local context. Um, what was identified as being critical was not just to put the data out there without some supporting narrative to help people understand what were the local priorities, what was the starting position, if you like, for that particular council, what were the, the, the policy objectives that that council was pursuing. So councils are currently working to um, improve the way that they include this information within the reporting in order to 
to provide those caveats and to, um, to provide that narrative. And, and we've actually got an event with councils next week to actually look at the good practice that's emerging across councils in terms of how this has been reported uh, to the public, what feedback we're getting from the public in relation to this reporting and how we continue to improve that. And we're working with Audit Scotland as well because they're just currently undertaking their reviews of public performance reporting to build on the findings from that review also so that that can shape how councils um, address this. Do you want to come back? Just, just say, you know, I think it might be useful um, following that event if the committee was supplied with information on how councils are using this information and how they're reporting it to the public. I think that would be useful, certainly, for a further discussion. Uh, as well, you know, in terms of the general um, uh, numbers being published and discussed as they always are, um, it would be, I think, ideal, uh, in, the, in an ideal world, the case that, you know, that Fife story, the, the reason why those numbers being different in Fife, for example, were actually um, spread around authorities as well, because they may choose to make the same decisions. Um, and we'll probably come back to outcomes in a second. In terms of the metrics we discussed at length in the run-up uh, to the formation uh, of this new framework, some of the the old indicators that were used, uh, how many library books uh, were borrowed per thousand population is one which really didn't show what services libraries provided in today's world. Um, and we have from Elma Murray, the chief executive uh, of North Ayrshire, uh, a, 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 a wee statement about uh, the correct metrics or indicators. Uh, she says that there are some indicators that would be more appropri appropriately measured by alternative means. For example, one of the indicators is the cost of parks and open spaces per thousand population. Would this metric be better suited to acres, hectares of parks and open spaces? Are you continuing to look at each uh, of the indicators uh, and trying to modernise, if you like, um, uh, the, the, the actual measure itself, because some things become a little bit irrelevant over, court, well, sometimes short spaces of time. Miss Lynch? Absolutely, we are. It's, um, it's, it has been a key priority for the programme to this point, um, and it continues to be a priority. Um, we've identified that there are limitations in some of the measures, but there are also still gaps in some of the measures that we have within the framework. Um, so again, we've been working with um, all 32 authorities to identify where the limitations exist. So where are they still um, causing some concern in terms of their robustness and where are the key gaps. So some of the priorities for the, the, the period ahead to address are um, improving some of the, the, the guidance around the financial measures to ensure consistency. Um, we want to strengthen the indicator we have about gender equality because at the moment we just focus on um, women in the, the top 5% positions but we actually are interested in gender equality across the workforce so that's an area we're looking at. Um, we are also looking to strengthen um, the measures we have around um, outcomes for children. I think that was Colin, Colin mentioned that earlier in terms of preschool and primary school education because at the moment we have cost measures for this but we don't actually have an outcome measure. So that's something that we're working with ADES and other professional and educational authorities to look at how we address that. Um, and also um, strengthening the measures we have for um, older people and adult social care because again we recognise that this is an area within the framework that requires to be strengthened uh, and then just a specific example that we're also working with councils to do is in terms of you mentioned sports, culture and leisure is to look at whether or not um, a, a net measure of cost in this um, aspect would be more relevant for authorities than a gross measure, which is what's currently there. So that's been identified by the directors of finance as a, a piece of work that they would like to take forward. Thank so you. yes, there's certainly some areas that we're looking at improving. Okay, John Wilson, please. Thank you, convener, and good morning. Uh, the issue, a number of issues I would like to pick up on, just in terms of the statement uh, submission and the issues raised by the call for uh, no opinion from the public. 
What is the engagement of COSLA in this process? Because what I've heard so far is it all seems to be officer-led. Uh, and Ms Lynch, you made a reference to an event taking place next week. Who has been invited to that event? And is that purely officers, or are there elected members invited to this, these events as well? Ms Lynch? Uh, we run a number of events across the year for the range of audiences. The event next week is specifically for officers. Um, however, we also run events for elected members. We ran four different events last year for elected members, and we're also um, scheduled um, an offer of four regional events for elected members this year. So we recognise the importance of elected members. Uh, COSLA are on our project board. Um, uh, they are the vice chair of our project board so absolutely provide an ongoing steer and involvement in terms of the developments of this program and we actually we did um, present at the recent leaders meeting in January as well for all um, the elected member leaders in order to ensure that um, they were up to date with the program developments and understood the, kind of the key um, themes that were emerging from the project at this stage so we certainly do prioritize that area in the work program. Ms Leach do you want to come in? Add to that, um, I think most local authorities will embed this within their, their development programme for elected members. Um, and only yesterday, our um, benchmarking information went up to our um, policy um, and performance committee. And at that level, we, the, the, the elected members must have spent about an hour scrutinising the data that, that came from it. And that's where the narrative is as well. Um, so at a local level, um, having it embedded in our public performance reporting um, in a variety of different ways allows members to, to, to give the scrutiny to make the challenge to officers that you would expect. Just in that, you said the councillors, council committee sorry, not the, all the councillors of the council, council committee spent an hour scrutinising that. Yes. Uh, how, how long does it take the officials to scrutinise the same information that's being presented? And I'm sure it's longer than an hour. Well, it's part and parcel of the way that we start. We, we look at improving services, um, and we use this with a range of other measures. I mean, we part of the, the benchmarking is um, satisfaction responses. Um, most local authorities take that to a, a much more refined level, whether it's um, in five. Um, terms. There is the, the people panel. There's a lot of other local authorities that have a citizens panel. So the engagement through that is, is, is really crucial. Um, the, the time spent is becoming much more part of the whole improvement agenda. Um, and increasingly, um, we're looking at aligning our, the feedback from complaints or compliments um, back into some of these areas where we think that you know, either we want to improve or that there are policy issues that we need to um, be thinking about as a council. So it's not just about engagement with people who are, are interested in that type of engagement. It's about using the, the, the passive responses from individuals on our, our services to tie it back into um, performance information in a way that helps us to think about how can we improve and this is what it's all about it's about how can we um, make better use of our resources and how can we provide a better service to the people of our, our communities John. on that can I ask the panel are you confident that all local government elected members are aware of the benchmarking process and the criteria used within their own local authority for measuring service delivery because Ms Leach you mentioned earlier that councillors are elected on manifestos. How does that then tie in with the ben benchmarking criteria and performance of a local authority and how does that stand against what may be the manifesto that the leading party that takes administration is elected on? Ms Leach first please. Well, I think if I can give you a practical example in my own area, um, again, the, um, our elected members um, have prioritised um, the environment of East Lothian, um, parks and open spaces, it was mentioned earlier, and it's been one of the responses. Now, we're actually, we spend the most um, in, in all of the local authority areas on parks and open spaces. Um, that's a policy decision. 
Um, having said that, um, we are now looking at whether or not that level of expenditure is something that we want to continue with, and that's a process of engagement with our elected members, first and foremost, but increasingly it's an engagement process with the, the electorate, um, the people of East Lothian. And one of the things that we're now doing as a result of the benchmarking information, we've taken a, a selection of um, people from our citizens' panel and we're now um, looking at a, um, a citizen-led review of parks and open spaces to help inform that, that policy decision. So that's a, an example of where policy, benchmarking and engagement is starting to come together. Thank you. Mr Mayor, please. I, I would be very confident that councillors across the council are familiar with their own performance framework and how the benchmarking framework is embedded in it. If you were asking me, do I think all 1,200 councillors in Scotland are entirely aware of the benchmarking framework as it would appear in our overview report or on the website? Very possibly not. Uh, but that wouldn't bother me very much because the point of the benchmarking framework is to, is to support their own local performance scrutiny, uh, not to be treated separate from what they are doing as a council by way of both scrutiny and improvement. So uh, I would be confident about your latter point. Uh, I couldn't honestly give you an accurate figure for the first point. Ms Lynch, do you want to add anything? Um, I'll just add two more technical points, really, is in the project board um, overseeing the programme, one of the things that they look at on a regular basis is the extent to which um, individual councils are including this information within reports to elected members. So, it's a, again, it's an ongoing um, focus. And the other is um, we were asked by councils last year to deliver a programme of training for officers to support them in developing awareness sessions and approaches with their own local elected members um, to again support elected members to engage with this information and to interpret that. So that's something that we, we did um, earlier this year, is, is delivered a programme on that. John. Thank you, Convener. One of the issues I have is that, yes, you can deliver training and you can, uh, to officers, to then take that to the elected members. It's whether or not the elected members feel there is any value to participating in these training events. And I know from the authority that I sat on uh, and some of the training events and still get information regarding some of the training events that are held in the local authority uh, where there may be only half a dozen elected members turn up to particular training events. And it's about trying to understand uh, because benchmarking is not just about within the local authority, the measures my understanding is the benchmarking process and framework was established so that local authorities could compare against each other and within the families uh, that had been identified. So how do we make sure that that type of measurement against the delivery of the families or other local authorities of a similar nature or size is taking place so that local authorities understand how they could... Because part of it, my, my understanding, was to try and deliver things better uh, and use the examples from other best practice authorities. Who's going first? Ms Lynch? say a little bit about the programme of family group work that's ongoing because as you quite rightly say this is of particular interest to elected members also in terms of when we present the information or share the information at high level when you're able to then share further um, richer detail about what's emerging from the family groups, I think that um, makes the, the data far more relevant. There are, um, are family groups currently um, being established in areas such as looking at services for looked after children, which we talked about earlier, also in terms of waste management, council tax and in sports services. Um, and so all 32 councils are currently working within these families in order to come together to use the high-level data as can openers and then to drill down into this to try and understand better what's behind the differences between these councils, um, what opportunities are there where we can learn from each other, because some of the differences, as we've talked about, are absolutely um, 
about policy priorities and local decisions that are taken and local context factors. But some of the differences in performance are absolutely about new or innovative practice or about different ways of working. So that work is ongoing and we continue to work with councils to roll that out across other areas um, across the framework. And already there are being examples um, generated in terms of good practice that um, are being highlighted within these groups. Alec, is it in this point? No, okay. I give you a, a thousand more questions I would like to ask, but I've, I think I've taken up enough time at the present moment. You may get the opportunity later. Um, Claire Adamson, please. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Um, I, I was interested, um, uh, uh, having all, also um, served as a local government councillor as well, um, that about the differences in, in the areas that, that are benchmarked. And while I can quite easily see how you can do a financial comparison, delivery comparison with, um, you know, bin uplifts, lights been on and off, you know, um, and things like that. When, when we get to the, the issues that, that my colleague Alex Rowley raised regarding um, areas where it's more intrinsic and it's more about the outcomes, um, I draw your attention to the um, evidence from Museum Scotland about um, the focus being on the financial indicators in terms of visitor numbers rather than anything to do with the importance and the contribution of the wellbeing. Um, so if I put it in the context of the government strategic objectives from 2007, a wealthier, fairer, safer and stronger, healthier, greener and smarter, if we're having to look to other reports and other pieces of work to get the full picture, is there not something you know, fundamentally wrong with how we're approaching the benchmarking process? Should we not be able to do that all within this process? Mr Mayor, uh, I mean, I think uh, the, the point about outcomes that our colleagues from museums and galleries raise, benchmarks are measures that for us pose questions for people, pure and simple. So the financial measures we are satisfied are standardised and accurate. The footfall measures are measures taken on exactly the same basis as the national galleries take their measures and so on. So if they were wrong for local government, they are certainly wrong for everybody else as well. And if a lot of the figures we talk about attendance at galleries and museums would simply emerge to be wrong in that model. So we are satisfied the measurement is right. What I think we see the point of the measurement as being is, well, if some people have, for example, very significantly managed to increase their footfall to the museums, because most of the change here is actually increased use uh, rather than decreased expenditure. The unit cost per person has come down because of that. That's a success story and it's important. Um, what have they done to get there? Uh, how have they managed that? Now, in some cases, that will emerge to be we've begun to run free bus services for certain communities so they can access the art resources we have, but it would cost them quite a lot in low incomes if they had to get buses there themselves. So we started to look at the whole transport connection, etc. Um, so in a way, we see the benchmark as posing a question for people, and there would be a small number of museums where that question is posed quite starkly. There is a genuine issue of footfall declining quite sharply. But why is that, uh, and how can that be reversed, and so on. On the outcomes of museum and galleries, I'd have to say I'm working on a completely separate thing with the directors of culture and leisure in Scotland just now, which is entirely about how do we begin to better demonstrate the value we believe comes from participation in music, sports, arts, and so on, which I do believe. Uh, I'd have to say, even sitting down and looking at evaluative studies and so on, we're still quite clunky around defining outcomes here, and we're still quite clunky about measuring. So there's a lot of assertion, but if you poke a stick at the assertion, it often kind of dissolves uh, fairly quickly. So there is quite a lot of work to be done in some of these areas to get to a much clearer understanding of outcomes. But also, I think, and this committee has raised it with us before, outcomes for who? Uh, you know, if we are running absolutely and rightly uncharged art galleries and museums in Scotland, presumably we want to make sure the whole community benefits from that and not just some sections. So we'd also start to need to know more about the segmentation of our audience. So how are we disproportionately getting use from certain communities and disproportionately not getting use for others? And if that's the case, what we can... That's the drill down bit, I think, that uh, Angela referred to earlier on. And we know that some councils are looking at this matter 
in some detail. Uh, you know, who is using, who isn't, what could we do to get the people who are not using to use, and so on. So I think that I would axiomatically assume the value of arts and museums, but I think we then have to demonstrate our value by saying, well, are we getting the footfall you'd hope you'd get if you're publicly funding absolutely and universally free access to this. And that's the question the benchmark poses. We then need to go on and answer that question. I absolutely accept the point from the Galleries Museums. Ms Leach. Thank you. Just to, to add to that, I think this is really where um, the can opener phrase really comes into its own, because from that, and, and I was interested in the observations made in the responses, um, in my own authority, we would then take that back into our improvement framework um, the improvement framework is the assessment of um, how well the, the service is performing and it's done by staff themselves. It's not managers. Um, they gather the evidence, benchmarking's part of that, and they then do the comparisons with others to see how do we compare. That whole process then is scrutinised um, to, to mixed extents with different publics because people engage because they're interested in a particular subject area. Um, so taking that to the individuals who are particularly interested in that, that topic and that service is the next stage to that. And in, in addition to that, in terms of the whole value of improvement, um, the, the improvement plan, um, we do further scrutiny on that with our local area network, which is all the scrutiny partners who then help us to look at um, the improvement journey and benchmarking is, is very much a, a part of that. I could also cite an example of um, where housing across the, the, the country is, is really embracing this. Um, they've, um, they, this is our own um, performance report that we put out to um, tenants and residents associations. Um, the benchmarking data is there, but it drills down to far, far more detail. And the detail that's in these reports has been developed by tenants and residents. So they've told local authorities the types of information that they feel have is of value in um, demonstrating the worth or the performance of these particular services. So, you know, housing um, have probably done an awful lot more than some services, but it's actually a good model that we can adopt. Um, and again, it links into the question of the, the, the committee on that engagement process that, and the journey that we're on in that. Okay, Claire. Okay. Yeah, my, my concern that all of this is, is that you can go through the, all that process in the area of housing. You may well um, have done all that process and, and be comparable with the, the, the other authorities that are in the group that you, your authority is in. But if you actually went to the families involved and said, is your housing improved? Where's the evidence that the outcome has actually been changed, even if the, the financial targets are, are similar and the process and delivery are similar? If you're not materially changing the outcome for the people it affects, and, and where is that information captured? Ms Leach? In some of these, if I can use the housing one, it's not the only example, but the benchmarking families are actually, you know, I can use our own illustration of that, that um, where we've compared our own performance with others. Um, where we don't perform, um, that's the, the question that we then go out and say, well, why? Why is it that there are others who, on the face of these indicators, look as if they're doing, um, they're, they're working more effectively, um, they've got a better outcome for people, and that's where the analysis, and that's where the narrative's important, and the whole improvement journey. And as Emily was saying, it's about taking ideas then from others and adapting them to your own circumstances so that that improvement is, becomes much more embedded. But I have to say, I think over the piece in local authorities, um, you know, the, the staff, and this is where the workforce is, is so crucial because it's not just about a certain few who understand these figures, it's about the workforce really being committed to that journey of improvement and linking everything back to better outcomes for, for local people. Thank you. Okay, uh, Willie Coffey, please. Thanks very much, and good morning to you. Morning. Um, uh, speak as a former member of the Public Audit Committee and also a Quality Assurance <laughs> Manager at some point in my past career. And for many years at the Audit Committee convener, we were always interested in the question about follow-up from the many good recommendations that often come out of reports and benchmarks and documents like this. And it's the part of the, the circle that's not completed very often that who does the follow-up? Um, I would imagine that the, report, the reports, the benchmark reports, tell you as much about what you've done and also look forward to what you might want to do. So who does that? Who does that bit reporting whether 
your good recommendations and advice and so on are, are taken up by the authorities across the board and how does the public see that? Who's going to take a crack at that first? Ms Leach? On, a, on an individual basis, um, again, it goes back to the, the embedding improvement as part of the culture. So that, you know, when the, the, the data comes out on an annual basis from the benchmarking, um, it's certainly something that um, local authorities will sit down at their, you know, with their administration, with various um, scrutiny committees and start to look at um, where do we need to, to look at. It, we need to tie it back into each of the priorities for the local authority as well, because at different stages they will have particularly different priorities that they've committed to through their SOA or through their council plan. And that's really where that level of, um, well, let's look at how others are, are doing. Attainment's a big one for for my own local authority, there's a big piece of work at looking at how others are, are um, improving attainment, particularly for um, people in um, disadvantaged areas. And, and Western Bartonshire have done particularly well on that just now. So we're looking to learn from, from them, um, not exclusively, but for, from the practices that they've currently introduced to try and um, equalise the, um, the attainment levels across their local authority. So it does happen very much at a, a local authority level. But supposing, supposing people picked up um, last year's report or two years ago or something and said, oh, these are great recommendations. Well, they done. How, how would they find out that information? Did they do it? I think <laughs> one answer is that, in a way, if you look at our overview report, it is a report on data and what questions and issues the data poses. And that's it. It doesn't actually make recommendations at all. But it, it would be improvement plans at council level that would follow from that. And improvement plans are tracked uh, through the improvement process itself. They're scrutinised by audit and scrutiny committees within councils. Uh, so there is a process whereby, if an improvement was agreed, are we delivering the improvement would then be tracked over time. So as an example, I'm working with a council just now who very similar to Angela are looking to see how they can improve and prioritising the improvement of educational attainment for kids from the most disadvantaged backgrounds within their area. Uh, that started out from the benchmarking framework. They weren't moving, they were improving, but they weren't improving as fast as others uh, and led them to engage with a range of other councils. What they've now got in place is a set of improvement plans with schools, with their community learning and development people, with their homeschool link people and with their employability people to say, we are now going to shift this onward sharply. That will be built into the performance appraisal of head teachers. So they now have targets about what's expected of them with respect to the composition of their school. It will be used to judge the education department, and that will be routinely reported on. So there, is, there are mechanisms, just to reassure you, uh, that as you move from the high-level benchmark comparison to the question that poses to the improvement action, that then does get built into what are really quite formalised processes for then taking these improvements forward uh, and reporting them. Uh, I mean, yeah, please uh, do. Mr Mayor. Um, because, you know, we've heard from Ms Leach there about embedding improvement. Uh, we've all heard time and time about continuous improvement. You've talked about uh, putting things into appraisal systems for head teachers. Uh, often what we have found, I would say, is that frontline staff who are delivering the services, who often know what the improvements should be, are often the ones that are least involved in terms of trying to get the outcomes that we all require. What are frontline staff's involvement in terms of these benchmarks? Um, are they communicated to frontline staff? Are they asked for their opinions to try and improve? Because all we're hearing here is top-level stuff. I think it, it, it does vary again, as you would expect, but um, if I can point to the Western Isles, for example, um, they, they've got a fairly innovative practice that they produce an annual report of their performance, again, based on their... their we must leach, because the Western Isles is kind of different in some regards, because it's a very small council, um, and quite frankly, the chief executive of the Western Isles is likely to know the vast bulk of the staff um, in the Western Isles um, and is particularly approachable. Uh, we've seen that for ourselves when we've been into smaller local authorities where the chief executive knows everyone and everyone knows the chief executive. 
but what is the situation in the, the North Lanarkshires or the Glasgow's or the Aberdeen's in this regard? I think one of the key features, and Colin touched on earlier, is embedding the um, self-assessment process, the self-evaluation process, and where it works particularly well is where staff at all um, levels in the organisation are involved. Um, and that's where um, an understanding of performance is very much at the, the heart of what they do. So we would certainly you know, be encouraging that, that type of approach. We obviously do a lot of um, feedback to staff um, Various local authorities um, adopt different approaches, such as Lean, Six Sigma, um, uh, the Vanguard approach. Um, so there are, are, are a variety of different mechanisms um, on a, an improvement um, level that are done. There's equally a, a number of um, measures that are put into place to engage people. Glasgow, for example, have just been have just gone through. I don't know if they've completed it yet. Um, a programme of engagement that has um, included all the frontline staff. It's been a two-year programme. And this is about trying to um, explain what the corporate objectives are, but also to give some uh, to give people at the front, you know, the front line, if, as it were, an opportunity to feed back on um, improvements on how they think think that things could be done differently. So there are a variety of techniques being used. Well, I sorry I interrupted your. No, thanks very much. I was very interested in that response as well. Can you, could I just um, carry on? Could I just talk about the, the framework in general? Emily, you, in one of your answers, you talked about modernising it or elements of it in relation to the question from the convener. Generally speaking, how do you see that developing with the Community Empowerment Bill coming soon? And do you see the framework itself evolving significantly as a result of that? And do you think the public at large will be able to influence and, and determine, in fact, what is in the framework. Also, you know, meaningful measures to them. Will they be able to shape the frameworks rather than have the frameworks done to them by the local authorities? Who's going to start with that? Ms. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess there's, there's two elements to this. One is we very much, you talked about closing the loop on this, and we very much are um, focusing on how we use this information to understand what's happening in local communities and use that information to engage more effectively with local communities. And as we are more successful in doing that, that then will help us shape and refine the measures and the way that we present them. So we, we very much see that as, as a loop in terms of um, once we um, if, if manage to affect more effective engagement, then that will help us um, understand what measures are important and how this should be shared. But the other thing is to also just reiterate the point that Colin made earlier about the development of the community planning um, approach, because that very much has at its heart um, ensuring that this information helps us understand um, what's happening with local communities, understand, for example, where significant inequalities exist across or within local communities and engage more effectively with those local communities to understand what's behind this, what's, um, and also to help um, ensure that they are shaping the solutions to that. So again, across the year ahead, as we develop this work, we plan to work with community planning partners and local communities to shape and develop this approach. So absolutely the intention would be that local communities shape what, what, um, what are the measures that are important to them and importantly, how should this information be shared and reported to them in a way that they can engage with it and make sense of it. So that's certainly an intention for the year ahead. Anyone want to add to that, Mr Mayor? Just very briefly, uh, I mean, I worry that we may have overhyped this framework to you because some of the questions are implying it does things it doesn't do. It is no substitute for all of the other good things Angela talked about. We do need robust self-assessment built into the whole way we run our councils. We do need robust and properly resourced community engagement and development as part of what we do as councils. Uh, so I suppose what I would want to say is I think what this framework does is what we've said in the tin. It doesn't do anything more than what we said in the tin, though. Uh, you know, so it is one tool but no substitute at all and needs linked to all of the other improvement tools and mechanisms that Council is using. I think your points are utterly germane. 
is the underlying improvement planning then sufficiently robust? Is it sufficiently engaged with the communities on whose behalf we're trying to improve things? And do they understand what we're trying to do and so on? Just to reassure you, again, every council has other mechanisms for collecting data from communities as part of service reviews, etc. Final point I'd make in uh, line with our colleagues in Audit Scotland, clearly councils publish this data and have to, as under a director from the Accounts Commission for Scotland, they are local auditors will look at whether they respond then to the data they've published. So you've said you're off the mark with your family in this respect. The auditors are perfectly entitled then to say, fine, what are you going to do about it then? So there is also the statutory audit function plays in it, uh, into this as well. This is, this is not just a free-floating voluntaristic thing. This is within a framework where councils are statutorily audited for best value and improvement as routinely part of how they're dealt with. I think we understand uh, the linkages between this framework and all of the other uh, improvement uh, bits and pieces that need to go on. And, you know, the uh, vast bulk of the committee, bar uh, Mr Buchanan, have been uh, councillors, uh, some in very recent times. Uh, some still, I think, if I remember <laughs> rightly. Uh, oh, right. Um, uh, I'm corrected. Uh, so we do understand that. And, you know, there was, I have to say, a lot of hype about this framework. That is a fact. Um, and I think one of the key things for us is to make sure um, that, you know, hype uh, becomes improvement. Um, and, you know, that's one of the reasons why you're going to come back year on year round about this framework. Uh, Willie. One last question, please. Thanks, convener. It's about the issue of families. And uh, when I was a local councillor, I can well remember the family grouping that East Ayrshire was part of. But from time to time, I did wonder why we couldn't get a comparator, say, between uh, an activity in East Ayrshire and an activity in Glasgow. We were just never part of the Glasgow family because of its size. Uh, is this system developed enough now to allow either elected members or officials or the public to choose what comparator families they would wish to group? And yeah, I know you would need some software to do that rather than a paper report. So can we do that kind of thing? Can we look at different deprivation indexes around Scotland and group them together, for example, and, and explore comparators for ourselves? Ms Lynch? Absolutely. This is uh, one of the priorities that we've identified um, in terms of how to improve the framework, if you like, going forward. And it is about refining the family groups. We, we had to make a start, and I think the original groups were agreed as a starting point in terms of providing a practical structure, but also in terms of providing some similarity in terms of the challenges that those groups of councils faced. We have, however, as families have started to work together, certainly identified that um, the, the family groups are not always right for all of the subjects that we're looking at. Uh, Colin might want to say a bit more about education, for example, because that's one that we've been looking at. So we would certainly be keen to work again with the councils to identify what better groupings or ways of uh, arranging the groupings would work, because ultimately there's simply a structure to support councils to come together and share and learn. Um, and so therefore I think there is that opportunity to make sure that they are refined so that they're more appropriate. Very briefly also, there is a visualisation tool, I think I'm using the right language here, I may not be, but that would allow you to go on and explore and make comparisons between any councils you would like to explore and make comparisons between across the whole range of indicators. So if one wanted to make up one's own sense of what a family should be for certain purposes. Emily's point about education, I think, is an interesting one. We and it's almost the point the chair made at the beginning, are we benchmarking our past or are we trying to move to our future? If you put every council with quite a high level of deprivation together and say, well, we know that affects education, are you building an element of a self-fulfilling prophecy into the future around that? Uh, we're saying we don't really expect that people from deprived backgrounds will perform as well as others. Now, the challenge is, how do we help them to? <laughs> but we shouldn't simply create families and stick with them that imply if you've got deprivation, your education results should necessarily be worse than others. And I think one of the interesting things that's happened, uh, and Angela alluded to Western Bartonshire, but there are other councils who've made spectacular improvements over the trend time we've got, the four years, in the performance of kids from disadvantaged backgrounds, not all of which would be regarded as very disadvantaged councils, but they are doing very well with disadvantaged communities. And there are things there for, for other bigger councils with a lot of disadvantage to learn from those. So you're absolutely right. We should not be too rigid about the family boundary. OK, thank you. Alec Crowley, please. I, mean, I, I should say that I'm a big fan of this approach. And, and actually, um, 
when when the first informational benchmark came out, I was a councillor, and I, I remember being so excited, trying to plow my way through what was there then, because I actually think, but to John Wilson's point, that the benchmarking information can actually empower councillors uh, very much so to an extent that I had certainly never felt empowered before by being able to look right across the country. So I suppose one question is how is, because that was in the early days and a lot of the data was raw and it was, you know, I was interpreting it one way and I was being told it was different, but that information I assume has improved, so it would be good to get an upgrade. A sort of update on that. But my second point, if you, if, if you look at the, the view received from Mary Hill Summerston Community Council, where they say offering a wide range of performance indicators in comparison, um, successful appeals planning, etc. But they go on to say that, that they, they highlight the indicator how clean is my street. Um, and, and, and they really say that they would need to get more of that detail and how you could get that detail down at community council level. And back to what you said, Colin, I accept that it is exactly what it says on the TAN, and it's not about the improvement service and pulling this together for every community. But have you done analysis of how councils are using the benchmarking, both in terms of how they're using it to improve services, but also how are they using it to get to Willie Coffey's point with the Community Empowerment Bill, how are they using it to actually then get that information down to a, a, a meaningful level within communities so that communities can compare between each other, but also a, more widely about how it's performing in Scotland? Ms Leach. Thank you for that. Um, I think that's absolutely key. I mean, there is a real push towards what we're calling place-based approaches to um, service delivery rather than it just assuming that um, one size fits all regardless of the size of the local authority. So um, myself and others, um, again across the country, have really been using the benchmarking data, expanding it and really looking at what does that mean in local areas. Um, most local authorities, I think, have some type of fora, whether it's a partnership, whether it's an area committee or, or the likes. And on the basis of that, the detail is now broken down much more to perhaps not community council level, I have to say, but certainly um, ward or, or area level. And, you know, this is an example of one that we, we do in our area partnership um, has been furnished with, with this. And it's on the basis of this data that they are now setting the priorities for their local area. So um, it's taking the benchmarking, using it as the can opener, and then with communities really distilling it down so that they can make sound judgments on where they would like to see our services being focused. It would be good to get a copy of that, Kavina. Sorry? It would be good to get a copy of that. Uh, uh, if we could, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Mr Mayor? Uh, I think you're absolutely right. We are presenting data at a very high level for the whole of a council. Clearly, for example, if you look at the performance of children in education, whether S4 or S5, there's an average there for a council as a whole. The variation around the average will be staggering. <laughs> and you need to take that right down to community level. Uh, so we've been doing some work with community councils across the last year, uh, kind of trying to get them... I don't think they're well supported presently, frankly. Uh, but I think there's a lot we can do with routine public domain statistics to get them down to that level. We've created a thing which I'll happily send you the link to called ViewStat, which would allow you to take any public statistics down to the level of communities of 600 to 1,000 people. The difficulty is that won't always tidily correspond to a community council's sense of identity as to what a community is. These are geographies that are used for public statistics, but at least it would allow them to take all the educational results on an authority and say, well, OK, what happened in the two streets next door to me then? And you can actually pull that up and look at that pattern over time. So we put 10 years worth of data into this thing and said, look, if you want to look at trends, you can look at trends. It's by no means perfect. Uh, its design standard was it needed to work for someone who was at least able to book a Ryanair ticket. So if you could book a Ryanair ticket, you can use the damn thing. Uh, so it's relatively simple, but it does at least allow a much more ready access to public data. So that kind of sits below the benchmarking data, and I think your point's a valid one. That drill down bit really does matter, because the real action is happening in quite small communities, actually. Lives are varying, they're getting better, they're getting worse, whatever. And we need to be able to get our analysis down to that level. But I think Angela's right as well. Most councils now 
have mechanisms for uh, both council planning but also community planning increasingly down to kind of neighbourhood level. Edinburgh would be a good example, and then sub-neighbourhood level even in some cases. So we need to be linking the benchmarking at one end to that pattern of engagement and working with communities at the other end to get value out of CRB. It will be helpful, though, I think, because it will give communities a right to challenge us on whether we furnish them with enough information. Mm -hmm. you know, so, in a way, one of the rights, I think, CRB confers in a community is to say, well, you aren't actually achieving the outcomes we want in terms of how informed we are, sort of. Uh, and public authorities, whether health boards or councils or whoever, will have to look to make sure they are satisfying communities in terms of what they feel they need to know and what they feel they want to know. So I think there's actually quite an important role for CRB in driving forward an agenda about an informed public and alongside empowered communities. Alec, do you want to come back? No, no that's fine. Thank you. Cara Helton, please. Convener, um, it sort of ties into this work about how we better meet the needs of every community. Um, and going back to the evidence that we received, I'm looking at the evidence from Clear Fife, and they've said that they think there's a democratic deficit and that in a lot of communities there just isn't really the opportunity for residents to be consulted. And also they, they're sort of look, wondering whether it would be a good idea to develop an indicator on the levels of um, consultation and the quality of local authority consultation and indeed the activity of local councillors. I wonder if the panel would like to comment on that. Mr Mayor. <laughs> uh, yes, they are right that we use the household data to get a measure of residents' experience of local services. The Scottish Household Survey is an old Scotland survey, so it does give us that, but it's thin. And therefore, in any given year, the chances of you being involved in that survey are utterly negligible. Uh, so if that's what we mean by a democratic deficit, there's no question that exists. Councils themselves then have things like citizens panels, residence surveys, etc. But I would accept that we could and should do better here. We've tried to outline costs just now because we need to get board approval to do this. If we wanted to power up the household survey, let's allow a lot more people to be involved, because it's a very high quality survey, but it's got quite a narrow base, about 12,000 people across Scotland. To get it up to a decent level from a community point of view, so we could disaggregate the data a bit, we are talking probably a million, 1.5 million. I'm just never having that, uh, is the problem. So. Uh, many councils, many local authorities, yep. community planning partnerships, other bodies are carrying out uh, very similar surveys, uh, pretty comprehensive ones on a regular basis. So why can there not be cooperation in terms of bringing uh, these kind of things together rather than reinventing the wheel and creating uh, something much bigger? Um, you know, there are councils with citizens' juries yep. who are regularly in contact with a thousand plus people in their particular area. Why can there not be collation uh, in terms of that? I, I was picking up on the point being raised about getting down to community level. If you have a citizens' jury of a thousand people for Glasgow, there's nothing I can do. That's a statement about Glasgow as a whole. It's not a statement about any community in Glasgow. And indeed, the jury will be weighted to represent Glasgow's population as a whole, not the population of any community in Glasgow. I took the question I was being asked to be, how do we get this much closer to actual communities and allow many more of them to express their views about public services? So a thousand of a sample annually, which is perfectly decent from a representative statistical point of view, is a pretty thin engagement with the almost 500,000 people who live in Glasgow. Uh, if that was all you were doing. So I take your point, there's a range of things happening. Our problem is they're not happening in any standard basis. So if you said to me, could I benchmark that across Scotland? No, I couldn't, because people are using completely different instruments. They've evolved locally that suit their local purposes, their members' priorities, etc. The merit of the household survey is it's done on a standard basis across the whole of Scotland and is already part of government's commissioning. And so the idea was, could we piggyback uh, on doing that? Uh, so we have looked at linking up the work people already do at local level. One of the kickbacks we get there, though, is if people have got an instrument they think works particularly well for their communities, 
Why sacrifice that so you can get a standard instrument that then allows you to take a measurement across Scotland? So they are saying don't interfere with local practice. If the local practice is working to engage communities, we're not sacrificing that so you can get a better measurement. So uh, in a way, there's always a tension, I think, between the ways in which you could get to that. But m my view is sympathetic. I do think we need to get much closer to communities, both in terms of engagement, in terms of information, and in terms of making sure we're aware of the different views of different communities. Cara, do you no, want to come back? That's extremely helpful. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I'm going to take some quick-fire questions, because there's some ground that we haven't c covered. Quick-fire questions and quick-fire answers, hopefully. Uh, John Wilson, please. And welcome the issue about the household surveys. The difficulty is, I remember over 10 years ago, having the same debate with Scottish Government officials regarding extending household service. So best of luck in that one. The, the issue, the, the visualisation, Mr Mayor, that you referred to in the, the view stats criteria. Now, I know when I try to get onto some local government websites, I find it very difficult to navigate. And I think I can book a Ryanair ticket or an EasyJet ticket or a no, jet, to jet, jet yeah. ticket. But when I go onto some of the local government websites, they are tortuous in terms of trying to get some information. How can we get improvements in that area so that people can view those stats that you're referring to at a local level? Hey. Mr Wilson, was a very quick fire there. Sorry. Mr Mayor, quick yeah, fire. Answer. Very quick fire. If you go on to the benchmarking website, we've done dashboards for each council, which are dead simple. <laughs> but allow you to make comparison over time and comparison between councils. So it is literally a dashboard system, and we hope that that makes it more accessible. What we will welcome, though, is your feedback, and we get feedback from the public who use it to tell us what they like and, quite forcibly, what they don't like uh, about the way we've designed things, but we'll welcome your contribution as well. All councils also have similar dashboards now, and we're asking them to put the dashboards out in their websites so it's easier for the public to get the information quickly. John? You know that this committee spent some time in community empowerment and we've submitted a report about trying to engage with local communities. The responses we got in terms of the, the, our consultation with the public clearly showed that community councils felt they were not engaged with and they were not aware of the benchmarking process. How can we do this better? Okay. Um, I think it's... The, the, perhaps differentiate between the terminology and the, 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 the information. I think that um, the, the notion of benchmarking, it's a bit like community planning. Um, I'm not sure that all um, community groups really associate themselves with that. But when you do talk about trying to get the engagement and you, or giving them information, then that's quite a different matter. Um, I, I think that there is a groundswell of trying to get relevant information out to appropriate individuals without swamping people, particularly community councils, and the feedback that I have is that it's the easiest thing in the world for some of our services just to throw things out to community councils. They can be swamped with information and it's really difficult for them to differentiate between what's really important and of value to them and what they can ignore. So there is a bit of work that we need to do to make sure that we, we push relevant information to them um, at, at, at appropriate points. Okay. Um... We've heard previously about improvements to Scottish Water after uh, they brought in a new benchmarking regime uh, and they were comparing with uh, other bodies elsewhere. Uh, to what extent uh, are you now using external co comparators uh, in the rest of these islands or in the rest of the world? Ms Lynch? Um, I... It's, again, it's something I think you'll probably be able to give more detail on, Colin, but um, in terms of the international comparisons that he we looked look at... He looked at you. I know, I know. I'm just I'm realising that I, I do know, I remember speaking uh, to um, a couple of colleagues before about, particularly for Glasgow, for example, is um, what they would like to to do within this approach is to include more detail on cities uh, across the UK and that's something very much, we have a steering group and that's something that we're working to do is to look at what information is available across the cities in the UK that we can actually include um, I think it will be at the drill down stage and the family group stage rather than actually within the framework but they would actually stimulate those discussions and support those discussions so, so that would be broader in the UK. 
that will be looked at because certainly the evidence that we've heard at the committee previously showed that the vast bulk of improvement that took place in Scottish water was when they started comparing what they were doing with other bodies out with um, the UK. Um, so I hope that will be done. And, you know, it is certainly very difficult, as we've heard before, to put certain councils into family groupings because of what they are. So I hope that you will look at that. Um, can I ask uh, to, to what extent uh, you feel the general public and stakeholders are using the framework to challenge local authorities? Ms Leach, do you think that's being used to challenge local authorities? I think it's variable. By the public? Um, I think that we're now, we now have... Um, three years data, as you can see, you know, there, there's four for some, where we're starting to see trends. These trends are now starting to become much more evident in terms of, is it practice, is it a one-off, um, and what could we do differently? Um, I, I do think that putting the, the information out through the public um, performance reports is one thing, and there will be certain groups that will be particularly interested in that. But if we really want true engagement, we need to distill it a bit more so that it's relevant for the particular groups who want to engage with us on different subject matters. OK. Um, obviously, the committee has been looking a great deal at community planning over the last few years. Um, and we've heard previously that uh, certain targets that are put in place um, uh, at, uh, at councils uh, may actually, uh, in terms of the single outcome agreement, uh, co come at a completely different angle from targets that are put in at the health service. We've had a number of folk uh, in response say, um, should we be looking at the outcomes uh, via the, social, uh, the single outcome agreement frameworks uh, to include council and health uh, authority outcomes rather than just taking measures on local authority uh, business alone? Is there a view on that? There is. There is a view we need to do both. So we need to have a framework within which performance against outcomes and SOAs is consistently measured and publicly available. Uh, I think that doesn't mean we still wouldn't want to do service level benchmarking on the cost efficiency and effectiveness of the way different councils deliver services as well. I think the two things are related and they will allow us to explore that relationship. So there is a significant bit of work going on which Emily is leading which will develop and is developing on that outcome approach, because I think the point is well raised by many of your correspondents. Uh, but that work is ongoing, and there are major areas where we are, if you like, shamefully short of clarity about outcomes at all. Uh, so when we talk about outcomes for older people, we are still struggling to put any coherent sense around what we imagine these outcomes are. Uh, and we use words like dignity, choice, and so on. But what would that mean, and how would you show that that was happening, if you like? So uh, there's a lot of work going on in that arena, and we will report back to you, if, it, if you would welcome that, uh, on progress on that dimension of the work as well as the dimension we've reported on today. I think it would be really interesting for us, and obviously next year we will, you'll be back anyway, but yeah. it would be really interesting for us to continue to be appraised of any changes that are made. Yeah. Obviously things like um, health and uh, social care integration may mean that you are going to put different measures in place Indeed. now that that jigsaw is going to be complete. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as the community empowerment bill uh, kicks in uh, after it's passed, obviously I think the level of engagement round about certain of these areas with the public will grow. Indeed. Again, you may look at the, the different uh, measures that you're using at, at that point. So if you could keep, keep us appraised of developments rather than us waiting to next year, that would be useful. Obviously, there were a number of requests from information, which we'd be grateful if we could receive. But could I thank you very much um, for your evidence today? Uh, and I suspend and we now move into private session. ...and attention because it helps us. Thank you.